Hello and welcome to Nodes and Wires, uh, where I'm talking to various guests who regularly respond to today's aspects of music technology in an attempt to map the current electronic music network. So today I'm going to chat with Dennis DeSantis, composer, sound designer, author, percussionist and head of documentation at Ableton in Berlin. Hello Dennis, how are you? Hello, I'm, I'm good, how are you? You have quite a diverse musical biography that seems to be roughly divided into two parts. Um, <laughs> one that is connected to a strong academic background and 20th century avant-garde as well as jazz, and one that is rooted in the popular electronic music domain. You received a Doctor of Musical Arts degree in composition from the Eastman School of Music, Rochester, New York and also hold degrees from Yale and Western Michigan University. Among your teachers were orchestral composer Christopher Roos, post-minimalist composer and performer Ivan uh, Zyporin, and contemporary classic composer Martin Bresnik. And beyond composition, uh, you also studied percussion with John Beck and Judy Moonert, as well as jazz drumming with Billy Hart, which is quite a big name. Mm -hmm. And you wrote scores for concert music in such classic formats as quartets or quintets that build upon traditional acoustic instruments, the piano, violins, cellos, flutes, clarinets, trumpets, trombones, horns, tubas, saxophones and marimbas. And amongst your commissioned works are pieces for the Staatsoper Stuttgart and the Carnegie Hall, the latter of which consisted of chamber orchestra arrangement of autocratic music. And at the same time, you worked as a sound designer for Native Instruments, at least from 2003 to 2005, and released and performed loads of remixes as well as house and electronica tracks that feature fuzzy pads, percussive sounds, a penchant for filtered uh, and ethereal sounds, as well as classic 303-ish and 909-ish patterns, all of which have appeared on a variety of labels, such as Ghostly, Global Underground, Cocoon and Kanzleramt. Now, mm -hmm. with such a rich musical background, how did it all start? And when did you become involved in music in the first place? Uh, I mean, music was always a big thing in the house when I was growing up. My parents were both sort of semi-professional musicians for a number of years, mm -hmm. uh, both guitarists and singer-songwriters um, with relatively eclectic tastes. So I grew up listening to a lot of classic rock, but then also Stravinsky was on relatively early. Um, and I grew up near Detroit in the 80s, the 70s and 80s. And this was an interesting time there when mm -hmm. electronic music was sort of in the, in the air somehow in a way that at, as a little kid, I assumed was, um, was everywhere. So I sort of took it for granted that 12 year old kids all over the world were listening to craft work on the radio mm -hmm. that wasn't actually the case. It was kind of a, it was something that was happening in Detroit. There was a very interesting radio scene that was all about finding this sort of new world of electronic music that was starting to happen mm -hmm. both in Detroit and also largely in Germany. Um, and that was a lot of the, so my sort of listening background was, this stuff that my parents would play and then this interesting radio world that I was discovering that was very much a Detroit phenomenon. And that all kind of fed into uh, my own sort of weirdo tastes as a, as a kid. So I assume you started out very young. It's interesting. I, I did start out very young, but not in a particularly systematic way. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, tinkering around on the piano from a relatively early age and tinkering around on the drums from a relatively early age and didn't get it at even a little bit serious until I got into high school and got more involved in a, into a real school band program. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and at that time, I thought that I was being very serious. And then I got to college and realized that I hadn't actually been that serious at all. <laughs> so, you know, I got to college and I had this this notion that I would do a degree in composition, but it was very unclear to me what that even meant. Right. And so, you know, the fact that I had essentially no music theory background, it didn't even occur to me that maybe I should sort of figure out how the minor scale worked at some point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I had a lot of catching up to do when I got to college. And then I'd sort of dove headfirst into that in a in a more focused and academic way. Mm -hmm. Was there um, an actual, I don't know, breaking point at which you moved from um, contemporary classical music to um, remix culture and electronic music? Or have you, I mean, you already hinted at having built up an eclectic um, taste from the get-go, but... Um, so have you always been involved in both? And is there not any dichotomy for you at all? I mean, I think there is a dichotomy. The, the electronic stuff actually came first. I mean, mm -hmm. I was aware of, of Stravinsky as a kid, but I was not aware of anything more modern than that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the contemporary classical music scene was meaningless to me, essentially, until I got to college. It was not a music that I knew anything about. But right. I did know about craft work, and I did know about Tangerine Dream. And that was the stuff that I was really, I think the first thing that really, uh, that I felt like was my music was this interesting 80s period of Tangerine Dream, when they were doing all the interesting film scores. Mm -hmm. And there was something and i didn't know steve reich at all and it was only later that i put together that there was a very strong influence there mm -hmm. um so electronic music was somehow always kind of there in the formative thing and then i only sort of became serious about classical composition in college so me getting into remix culture was essentially going back to childhood right mm -hmm. and in some ways this was a i think I found myself in this very interesting period when I was finishing my dissertation where I was like, I don't know, the idea of sending out techno demos somehow felt like an act of rebellion. Yeah. <laughs> like I had been in, I've been in this world of, of, of concert scores for maybe too long now. And somehow it didn't, it never quite really felt like my home turf. Mm. It always felt like a kind of layer that I put on top of my deeper musical interests, which I have absolutely no regrets about. Mm -hmm. But um, getting back into making music with sequencers very much felt like a return to home for me. But and I was trying to balance the two <clears throat> mm -hmm. for many years, like play gigs with a chamber orchestra and work on remixes at night. And, and eventually, um, That and my work with Ableton, I, I, things had to give. And what I ended up giving was essentially my entire relationship with concert music right. as a performer and, But, and largely as a composer too, just because that cost benefit thing wasn't working for me anymore. Like spend mm -hmm. weeks or months on a score and then maybe it gets performed and maybe it gets performed poorly. Whereas what the beautiful thing for me about electronics is that I get the the uh, interpretive layer out of the system entirely. Mm -hmm. It's like, it sounds like what I want it to sound like. But did this, um, did the experience with um, scoring uh, influence um, your approach to electronic music in some way? I mean, the way you I think, think so. or put together things? I think so. I, it's very hard for me to, to say exactly what the influence is. I mean, I think an awareness at least of the landscape of like what musical parameters are and how mm -hmm. you might think about structuring something in time and, and also a better understanding of harmony. Mm -hmm. in, in many ways, I think the influence went stronger in the other direction. Like I was writing a lot of, for many years, I was writing music on paper that started its life as a step sequence okay. and then performing kind of step sequencer actions on that music. Mm -hmm. And then the, and then I should have known that something was up because then the act of translating that to notation always felt like the work, not the fun. <laughs> so yeah, I can relate to that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Although I guess in a, in a, in a, in a way, um, I mean, today's notation would be entering notes, uh, 
in, in the arrangement view with the mouse or something. Sure. I mean, I think, you know, people talk about the, the piano role as being right. a kind of modern score, yeah. which I think there's something to that. You, it's certainly possible to read that and see what's happening, but it's no, it's no harder to push play right, to hear what's right, happening. Right. Whereas with a score, you need people. You already mentioned um, Detroit and, um, and that you grew up outside of Detroit and, and you've been living in Berlin for a while now. Um, both are quite significant places, I mean, particularly in the history of electronic music and genres like house and techno. Mm -hmm. And um, how did and do these local ties affect or inform you musically? Are they still relevant to your artistic everyday life or could and would you basically live and work anywhere? I mean, I especially ask the latter since we live in an era of uh, deterritorialization, and it's been pointed out in many recent discussions that local specific labels such as the Liverpool or the Manchester Sound, to quote some historic examples, um, that all of that becomes less and less relevant. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I think the the notion of localness is more relevant for people who spend a lot of time in live music culture mm. so um well pre-internet i mean when i was young the the fact of detroit radio was hugely formative for me mm -hmm. that's just in that's in my thing now for berlin it's harder to say because i came here for the first time in 2002 i think and that was to do a bunch of gigs and at that time i felt very much like part of my musical experience was going out to hear music, but I'm significantly older than that now and have a family and basically never go out. Mm. So most of my music listening is done. Most of my discovery of new music is done the same way everybody else's discovery of new music is, which is listening on the internet. Right. Um, mm. So in that sense, it's hard to know how much is affected by the location. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly one thing that, that influences the way I think about music is the people I work with every day. So I mean, working at Ableton is a, it's a house full of people who are actively involved in thinking about what's the next thing for music. And then right. in many cases also making that music, mm. that's big, that's hugely influential for me. Mm -hmm. So, um, with, well, your artistic background and working at Ableton, uh, how does a typical day in the life of Dennis DeSantis look like? I mean, these days, the big project that I'm working on is this um, this website that, that Ableton released last year called Learning Music, mm -hmm. which is uh, basically a set of interactive uh, tutorials that, that deal with super, super fundamental music making, but within the paradigm of the kinds of things you would find in, a, in an audio workstation like live. So instead of teaching you here's how major scales work and we're going to learn to read them on the score. It's here how they work. Here, here's how they work and we're going to play with them within the context of the step sequencer. Yeah. And this has been really fun. And that's that's the thing that I spend most of my time on now. You're actually putting the side together or uh, you're responsible for the content or both? I'm responsible for the content mm -hmm. and, and the sort of shape and concept of the thing. But I work with an engineer mm -hmm. who's, who's doing all of the, the JavaScript programming. Okay. The motto on your website says music for machines and people. Mm -hmm. And in accordance with that, you wrote a um, 342 pages book that was published in spring 2015. Mm -hmm. This one, mm -hmm. uh, Making Music, uh, 74 Creative Strategies for Electronic Music Producers. So despite uh, the associations the title might trigger, um, you point out in an implicit reference to Brian Eno's and Peter Schmidt's oblique strategies that, quote, making music is not a collection of vague aphorisms. Instead, and that's certainly not supposed to be a diss of oblique strategies. I think that's an amazing... No, no, no. But I guess <clears throat> that's what it was referring to. Yeah. I mean, it's just that oblique strategies is aiming at a very different problem than right. what I'm trying to solve with this book. It's trying to be a creative tinderbox i think right. like if you don't have ideas oblique strategies provides a good spark mm. my thing is for when you do have ideas but you're stuck right. or you've hit a wall or something right and i mean on top of that oblique strategies can cause something like um um well certainly some irritations or cognitive dissonance <laughs> 
It's, I mean, some some cards can really throw you off. I mean, in a good yeah, way. Uh, in a good way. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. So that, I mean, I think their thing is about being oblique, and right. my thing is about being direct. My thing is much less creative. It's more like here are some answers rather right. than here are some questions. Right. I mean, you, you follow a pragmatic and systematic approach, and um, mm -hmm. by providing what you call patterns, which consist of a specific problem followed by examples then followed by um, a solution, followed by examples. Mm -hmm. And um, and there's a three-folded structure to that, following the stages of the uh, creative process. So the first part is dedicated to problems of beginning, um, inspiration, how to get started. The second part to problems of progressing, uh, probably the stage at which creative struggles are most commonly experienced. And the third part of uh, to problems of finishing, Uh, like knowing when to stop and how to achieve the certain something that makes you feel comfortable with closing a creative chapter. Mm -hmm. And uh, with regard to the reason why you wrote this book, you point out that despite the vast availability of affordable music production tools and what is commonly called the result of a democratization of music production, the sheer process of music making uh, still remains hard. And by there are plenty of tutorials and teaching materials online most focus on technology itself or production techniques as such, uh, but not so much on music itself. Mm -hmm. Now, now the letter is, of course, uh, uh, you might call a transhistorical theme. I mean, being creative or uh, struggling to get a work done. Um, and you par primarily target groups um, who make music with computers and uh, DAWs. Um, hence my simple but maybe not so simple question after all. What does characterize electronic music production for you as opposed to just music production? It's a good question. I mean, I would say this was largely uh, a way to keep focus. So this, if I was trying to write a, think about a book like The War of Art, Stephen Pressfield's War of Art, for example. This is a, a very open-ended look at many of the same kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. But because it's open-ended, it, um, it, it has to be in some ways vague. It has to deal with the, only the sort of mental game yeah. of getting the work done. And what I was also interested in is Uh, let's dissect this rhythmic pattern, the sorts of things that you might do in a private lesson with a composition instructor or something. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to try to cover a scope that got much more down to the nuts and bolts of the actual work. Yeah. And the only way to do that, at least the only way that I could think of to do it in my own head was to make the target audience extremely focused mm -hmm. and be able to talk to people using a language that was very particularly grounded in a certain practice But then I, you know, I heard from people later that they were like, oh, yeah, I'm a choreographer and I like your book. It was useful for me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's great, but it's kind of a coincidence. Yeah. You know, those were not the people I was aiming it at. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, a lot of the stuff about, you know, write drunk, edit sober, these kinds of practices are not confined to a single type of of working experience or a particular type of creative person mm. that stuff is somewhat general but things about you know flipping a pattern upside down that stuff is very daw thinking i mean i was of course not asking this question in a naive manner but um because in that sense the terminology you use is already not innocent i mean the um talking about machines for example i mean which has of course um or um which is a, a term that is tied to a mechanical and automatization context mm -hmm. and conceptually to creative approaches like um, uh, tape music, minimal music. And the term pattern in itself, uh, is, uh, I mean, which you use methodologically, uh, can either relate it to traditional and in particular rhythmic musical elements as well as um, generative or uh, cybernetic contexts. Um, mm -hmm. And and I was uh, wondering whether you could say something about that or how you would generally um, characterize what makes electronic music production electronic music production. That's very interesting. I mean, for me, it's less about 
a notion of a particular kind of, um, I mean, I think for many, for many people, like, a an easy read of electronic music is that it's music about loops hmm. because this is the world that's so easy to create. And it's the world that is afforded by so much of the technology. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is not, I mean, that's a, that's a subset of, I guess, what electronic music practice can be. And for me, the thing that is the most exciting about it and the most liberating is that I can do it alone. Mm-hmm. Is that this notion of that I have the entire spectrum of sonic possibilities available to me without needing to interact with other people. And I, this sounds like um, some kind of weird, like creative narcissism thing, but it's, it, I think of it as this in the same way that I think of like distance running, for example, like you okay. could do this as a social thing, yeah. but there's also something sort of really meditative and flow state like about being alone with uh-huh. this practice and I also enjoy distance running, so maybe I'm just the kind of person who likes to get into my own head. Mm-hmm. But I also really enjoy the kinds of creative dialogues that I can have with machines because you can ask ridiculous things of them and they will just cheerfully respond. Yeah. Like, no, let's listen to this thing at 300 beats per minute at three in the morning for an hour <laughs> and just see what happens. And if you tried to do yeah. this with a with a session musician, like you're going to get a terrible bill at the end of the. <laughs> so you're cool. going to get pushback, and you're also going to you're not going to get the results that you want. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I think also some of this certainly is grounded in the kinds of musical results that you get. Like, I like precision, mm. and I learned the hard way that if you ask this of people, you get something beautiful and human but it's imprecise. And it's not because people aren't great players. It's because you're asking them to do something they can't do. Mm -hmm. I I mean, I can't do it. I can't play the way a sequencer plays. If you try to play the way a sequencer plays and you get that together with a bunch of other people, then what you end up with is the Steve Reich ensemble, which is fantastic. But to me, the thing that makes that music work is aiming for precision and missing and then getting this kind of chorusing effect Mm -hmm. where... People are slightly out of phase and slightly out of time and slightly out of tune. And this is a beautiful sound, but it, there's also something about straight 909 hi-hats, which I think is, a, is an entire aesthetic into itself. So that it has an almost um, contemplative quality for you. I guess, yeah. I mean, may, maybe that's it. Maybe it's like... You know, the old bumper stickers that I don't know if these were, if, if you've seen these before, but there used to be this bumper sticker that was like, drum machines have no soul. Mm-hmm. And yeah, was, Roger Lynn used to. Oh, yeah, right. Sure, well. sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, the irony there is not lost on anyone, sure. right? I mean, <laughs> but I mean, for me, it's, I think they have, they absolutely have soul. They just have a very mechanized soul. Mm. It's just a different one. You know, I'm a drummer too, and I love the way human drummers play. But I also love the way machines play. I mean, you even have the opposite among drummers like Yaki Liebezeit, where everybody would say, well, he's playing better than a machine. No, machine needs a, a, a he needs a humanizing function to, <laughs> to play as bad as a machine. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe. I mean, yeah. I never quite buy that, like yeah. the notion that people can play too stiff. Or maybe I would put it another way. It's that if the there's a certain kind of uncanny valley for people. And if they get into that space, then things are really weird. Like there's a certain kind of human feel and a sloppiness that's very musical. And there's a certain kind of almost, but not quite there precision. That's also yeah. very musical, but there's also a, a dark space in between where it doesn't sound right. Sure. You, know? you already hinted at it a bit, but uh, how does what you do as an author and head of documentation for Ableton inform your own musical practice? Uh, that's interesting. I mean, so I, the, the work I did on this book was very much kind of just out of my own head and it wasn't really about the technology. And then the work I do on documentation for, for Ableton products is, is a very different mind space. It's mm. more like, what do these buttons do? How do they interact in a system? Right. I would say the one, the one thing I can think of where my musical practice has been affected by the work that I do in documentation is that it's very difficult for me to get out of sort of bug finding mode. Mm -hmm. So 
I might have a free evening and I might be working on music for myself. And what I end up doing instead is submitting bug reports or like wondering why it is that a, that a thing behaves a certain way and why it doesn't seem to have a design coherence with another thing, which feels similar, which is not a very musical (laughs) way to to interact with the machines at all. So uh, that's maybe like a negative uh, outgrowth of the work. Maybe I should have asked a question in a more precise manner um, because uh, what I'm getting at is Ableton Live um, mm. is not really just another DAW and I'm not saying that because I'm talking to you now but uh, it's it's a production environment that reshaped the sense of um, how music can be produced particularly during the past 10 to 15 years. Mm-hmm. Um, in that way I think it's fair to say that Ableton Live introduced a paradigm shift in music production or how we go about it as it introduced approaches approaches from um, DJ culture, remix culture to other musical styles and genres and something that is usually summarized by the term non-linear means of production. Mm -hmm. And then there's obviously the um, whole modular element supported by Max for Life and um, being involved in the actual vicinity of the development of this production tool, um, how how does or did that shape the way you position yourself as someone who's active in the electronic music scene? Yeah, I mean, I think I've been using live as the center of my work for so long that uh, I guess it has taken on a certain liveness. Um, I don't quite know what that sounds like. Mm -hmm. Some people claim that they do. (laughs) I I don't mean about my music, but I mean about music made in live. Mm -hmm. And I think I, us- I think usually what people mean by that is that they recognize the sound of certain devices, right. which is, I think, maybe a secondary thing. That's not so much the liveness. That's just mm-hmm. DSP. I mean, right. what, what makes live, well, for me, what makes live interesting is, is like you said, the nonlinear paradigm, the notion of the session view and this ability to improvise um, with disparate musical elements without having to put them in form. Mm-hmm. I mean, it sometimes so, somehow harks back even to what you said in the beginning about um, uh, classical scoring versus uh, what you do in electronic music. But I mean, what what, what you can do now with live, uh, particularly in, in conjunction with the push controller or, well, previously other controllers as well. But um, if you're in session view, you can actually um, play the arrangement live. Mm-hmm. Totally. And it's a huge, it has hugely affected the way I write music. And it's, I mean, if you think about the conventional arrangement model of the mental model of how that works, it's not so different from a score, right? You have, you have time moving from left to right. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you're trying to finish something and export it as a two track master for other people to listen to, then you end up in that world anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, but beginning in that world is not necessarily where you want to be. This is not so different from looking at a blank piece of notation paper. Right. Whereas what I think what, what the session view affords is something more like a cut up method right. where mm-hmm. you throw the pieces in the air and they can land however they land. And this is very liberating, I think. And, and initially played back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and it's also, like you said, very improvisatory and very, um, it's very playful. It's a very playful way of thinking. And some people do not take to it. Mm-hmm. So I know a lot of people who use live and only use the arrangement view, mm-hmm. um, which is fine. Like, I think that's a legitimate thing too. Right. In November 2017, the third loop event, the Summit for Music Makers organized by Ableton, um, took place. And beyond officially Opening and closing the three-day marathon, uh, you also moderated six discussions and presentations that were focused on music production and um, educational matters. Mm -hmm. Uh, May I first ask you how the idea of Loop came about? Uh, It wasn't my idea. I mean, Loop was something that had been sort of in the thinking for a while before we did the first one in 2015. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just sort of the notion that we wanted to do something that had a conference feeling to it, bring people together in a physical space for some amount of time and let them interact with each other and let them experience uh, things. Because so much of the way we interact with people is done online. And we see a certain kind of 
a, a different feeling happen in things like user groups that we sort of thought it would be nice to try to do something like this on a larger scale. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really, I don't really remember exactly what, how the thing evolved before the first iteration, but we gradually sort of landed on this idea that exploring topics around creative strategies that was in the air anyway, not mm -hmm. just because of my book, but because I think that's in the air anyway, mm -hmm. like people want guidance and they want to know that they're part of a community of people who are facing the same sorts of creative challenges and loop works for this we mm -hmm. i think we built it in such a way that it it gives people these kinds of experiences that make them feel like they're part of a community for that they are a part of a community and that that community can exist in a physical space for a short time uh, you mentioned online communities online forums discussion groups uh have there been any particular ones or are you just referring to the official ableton forum or uh, ableton connected user groups or just um or, or about uh, any user group uh, people uh, at ableton are part of as well no i mean there are th there are these around the world there are these ableton user groups which are physical they're essentially meetups they're, i know i know yeah 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 and that that's sort of what i was thinking of as being uh -huh. you know, kind of inspiration for for trying to do this on a large scale in a physical way. But I mean, there's there's a dozen internet fora that are active at any time about, th that are people who come together to talk about electronic music production or live, um, you know, Reddit, Reddit channels or mm -hmm. Facebook groups or these kinds of things. They all exist, but th their virtualness means that um, you're never quite fully connected, I think. Or maybe I'm yeah. just old-fashioned, and that maybe is how people really connect now. Well, I mean, that it's still a difference, of yeah. course. But just there's something special that happens when you put these people in a room together, right. and you let them exchange in real time and in real space. I guess there are also more options for uh, all sorts of transgressions, which you don't <laughs> initially experience or are, are unable to uh, experience in an online community. I think so. Yeah, I think that's true. But um, before I would like to ask you about your personal impressions, um, I'd like to point out, uh, or I'd like to point in a different direction. Um, over especially the past two or three years, uh, one could observe that events like Loop are not so much about product placement uh, as one might expect it from an event organized by a manufacturer at first sight. In fact, the announcement of Live 10 played little to no role at all at Loop 2017. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was there installed on computers, but there was no announcement or, I mean, the announcement already took place and it was mm -hmm. just there. And, um, and instead, and beyond workshops and discussions about music production and technology, um, more and more topics come to the forefront that are of socio, cultural and uh, political significance. Um, another example that comes to my mind is Moogfest, organized by Moog Music in the US um, in North Carolina, and whose organizers recently facilitated a 50-hour live stream that exclusively featured female and transgender artists. And so in a way, events like Loop and Moogfest became platforms for discourses that are still related to musical environments, but not in a sheer consumerist or um, aesthetic manner. Now, while I think we can all agree that time has been overdue for the inclusion of other voices and topics, I would still like to ask you what you make of this tendency or whether you observe this tendency at all. Um, and do you see this as a beginning of something that is going to become more and more common? You mean this reshaping of the available voices in the conversation? Mm, yeah, and uh, sort of opening up the discussion and yeah. making it a more than just a um, cooperative event. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, it's just, you know, the, it's just not that interesting to invite 2,000 people and ask them to spend money and then do a product show for them. Like, hmm. there's we th everything you would ever need to know about, about the products is also available on our website. Like, right. that's not... That's not the, I think that's not the interesting thing about Loop. The interesting thing is that we have the, we have the, the network necessary to get very interesting people together and get them talking. And 
Ableton Live is only one small thing that they might talk about. And actually, we'd mostly rather that they not talk about it because yeah. it doesn't, we don't want it to feel like uh, it's about the products at all. It's about music and creative practice and technology and all the things that are the sort of underlying reason for us doing this work in the first place. Mm -hmm just basically just making the world a better place for music makers. Yeah. And one way that we might do that is by making what we think are cool products. And another way that we might do it is by getting cool people together and watching the sparks fly. Mm -hmm. It's all kind of comes from the same place. Like we, we just are interested in these topics. And within this context, this might appear as a heretical question. And I point this out without trying to undermine the importance of what we just talked about. But mm -hmm. isn't there also the risk that if um, manufacturers organize events like this, uh, topics like identity politics and how marginalized groups are being represented, um, that these um, these discussions become an issue, become valorized and marketed only just like any other product or currency. I mean, just in the sense of the infamous Berlin slogan, poor but sexy. Mm -hmm. um, because after all, the socio-cultural capital is a capital too, uh, and more than often the only one that remains for those who live and work in the precarious context the creative industry is known for. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question, you know, and this also, these same kinds of questions came up when we put out that website, the Learning Music website, like, mm -hmm. why, why should a company be taking the lead on something... Uh, do we taint, do we somehow taint the notion of, of education by attaching it to a brand in any way? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's, that's a very fine line. It's a difficult thing to figure out the balance of. We, I think we believe that we are doing good and we try to all the time and good like with a capital G in the sense of That we're making the right ethical choices and the way we often talk about programming for loop is that we want to briefly create uh, the musical world that we would like to see rather than the one that actually exists mm -hmm. so you know if you go to a festival to hear music this summer you will see a largely cisgendered white male stage that's what will happen right so we want to not do that. Mm -hmm. We don't want to reflect the state of the world as it is. We want to reflect a better one. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that things that aren't companies, but that put on similar events would see something in that that's inspirational, not just us. I mean, also Moogfest. They're, they're, I don't know the way they talk about their work internally, but from the outside, I see the same kinds of values being represented. And I think it's I think it's only good. I mean, that's that's the kind of weird dichotomy about electronic music or, or let's say, electronic music festival culture or the, the whole landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and what it is typically associated with, like being progressive and, and all that, com what comes with uh, technology. And at the same time, um, you still see 90% uh, uh, male bands and... Um, well, with the exception of maybe female artists that have been in, in the business for a while now uh, and uh, are not or could be considered as at least uh, hugely established. But even, even Björk is still complaining about the recognition. Yeah, and I think, I mean, if you look at something like Loop or Moogfest and you, and you say, yeah, that looks like a better picture of what things could be, then the alternative to not having corporations be the ones that are doing that is not having that exist, right. which would be, I think, unfortunate. Like, yeah. I feel like the world is a better place because of Moogfest than it would be without Moogfest. Mm. And so, thank God it exists, you know? <laughs> is, is there anything about electronic music in particular or the electronic music scene um, that caters well to these kinds of questions about how certain groups are being represented? That's an interesting question. I don't, I don't know. You might think that it has something to do with some vague thing about technology being more technologically minded people being more progressive, but I don't know that that's necessarily true. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at, I don't know, startup culture has its own set of weird, 
weird social problems? Um, I don't know. It, you know, I, if I was, if I was, I haven't thought about this at all, but it, now that you ask me and it just comes to mind, maybe it has something to do with this notion that you can do it yourself mm-hmm. and that you can do it behind the veil of the screen. Yeah. And if you want to be anonymous, you can be anonymous. You know, if you, if you're a woman and you're on stage, then there's already, you're, you're going to have a hard time in some way. There's going to be a power dynamic problem in mm-hmm. some way, but behind a laptop, you could be anyone. Mm. And maybe, maybe there's the possibility for more empowerment there. Not that people should be hiding, but that the music could at least come out. Mm. And, um, that could happen before the person was seen. I don't know if this, I haven't thought this through, but it feels to me like there's the, the potential there for electronic music to be a catalyst for, for the right kinds of changes. A lot of the um, discussion groups at Loop uh, were also about, um, um, well, I guess what you could um, generally call uh, the question of solidarity and uh, sort of collective movements. Or at least yeah. um, um, somehow find or create uh, spaces uh, for people um, uh, to, uh, to to be able to express themselves fully without f- having to feel marginalized. And uh, combined with the DIY approach, there was also lots of the uh, sound systems tradition even mm. reappearing. Um, and of course, in in the house scene, um, um, the, the, these questions have also been uh, important already, in my, particularly for homosexuals. And, mm-hmm. um, so that's why I was asking whether there's you think there's anything in particular. About I mean, if this. you're if you're trying to put on a a massive event with that that needs to seat two hundred thousand people, then you have a very different level of financial concerns and and uh, expectations than than a DIY community, and this is why it's so inter- Like, it's not just that these communities are springing up in order to provide people interesting creative spaces where mm. they can feel safe. It's also a business thing, mm. right? Like, sure. if you look at a if you look at a collective like Disc Woman, mm. for example, they didn't like what they saw in the state of of the way shows were booked so Mm -hmm. they became a booking agency right and this is very interesting like the fact that they said we're not gonna we're not putting on we're not getting these people together in a room to play music for each other we're creating events for Uh these people to go out in the world and make money and we're gonna we're gonna stock those events the way we want to see them well what struck me about disc woman is that um the sheer pragmatic approach really (laughs) Right. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, you could have guessed like uh, political protest or something. I mean, there is a certain activist element to it, uh, but um, but first of all, it's it's um, defined differently uh, amongst the group members. So first of all, it's a very heterogeneous mix. Every every member has uh, her different take on that, and and uh, apart from that, it's just about getting things done. And uh, right. That's what I think is so powerful, and you, you can only do this in a in a DIY world unless you have massive capital. Yeah. And you know, if you want to put on a Lollapalooza that has those <laughs> kinds of yeah. that has that kind of ethical approach, it's going to be much more challenging. Mm-hmm. What have been your personal loop exp- uh, impressions? I mean, uh, what discussions uh, struck you the most, and where do you still see work to do? It's always hard for me at Loop because I have to do so much moderating that I end up mostly only seeing the things that I'm involved in. Yeah. Um, I thought the I thought Susan Rogers was amazing. The this is a person who has like five different world class music careers at various points in her life. Like everything she has touched has been gold. Hmm. And this is a this is really fascinating. And then on top of that, you get her on stage, and she's she just wants to help people. Like it's this completely humble hmm. approach to everything. 
I, I don't know. I always, I always use this phrase. It's like, we like to get people to loop who have nothing to prove, but yet still prove it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, people who don't, they don't need a stage like loop. They're already sort of enshrined in the world as being people who made a difference. And yet yeah. they're still, they're still doing it, mm -hmm. you know, which I think is really, really compelling. And was there any particular event where you said, um, hmm, um, I, I would like to see more of that in the future for a future loop? Yeah. I mean, I think I really like the education strand. I mean, partly that's a lot of that is a personal thing. Like mm -hmm. I'm just interested in that topic. And so it was interesting to go to those talks and see those people and the problems that they're trying to solve and the solutions that they've come up with already and the problems they still face. Mm -hmm. I think this stuff is really interesting. For a while, we've been seeing lots of uh, new developments in the production of musical instruments. Um, so there are all kinds of alternative controllers by now. Uh, MPE and MIDI CI have just been accepted to be part of the MIDI protocol. Um, uh, all kinds of small yet flexible, affordable devices um, from, well, basically mobile phones to apps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, at the same time, we're also witnessing the reappearance of certain instruments in the shape and form of clones. There's also a massive retro maniac movement. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. and the internet redefined the relationship between manufacturers and customers by means of immediate interaction, basically. Um, and we have an ever burgeoning Eurorack scene. So all kinds of niche markets seem to leap forward, uh, make a leap forward. Um, as someone who's involved in questions about music technology on an almost day daily basis, what What are the tendencies that seem to be most significant from your point of view? Or asked in a different manner, as someone who's actually working in the industry, is there still time and willingness to watch out for new developments by other manufacturers? Like there is for uh, the common gearhead. Yeah, I mean, you have to do that or, or else you can't function as a company. I mean, you have, to, you have to know what's happening in the world and then also be able to ideally look a little bit further past and think, well, where is this headed? Hmm. Um, I mean, my stock disclaimer for, I think part of what you're trying to ask is that I can't talk too much about what we're thinking about. I mean, I can't talk at all about what we're thinking about because oh, no, no, no. Uh, it's that, all no. stuff for the future, <laughs> but we are thinking about it and we're always looking at um, what the world is doing and where we think that means that it's going. Well, this is not, uh, I'm not necessarily asking you as a representative of Ableton and sure. uh, what is Ableton going to do, uh, but um, w what you yourself um, experience or observe as being um, interesting or significant in some shape or form. Uh, on the one hand, you have people that are very concerned with the the absolute details of Uh, making a thing their own. So you have things like the Eurorack movement or Max MSP mm. or these kinds of things which try to make try to make it possible for more people to um, to really craft the thing from the ground up. And then on the other hand, you have sort of the exact opposite where there seems to no longer be any shame or stigma associated with like presets for example, the way there used to be. And so I don't know, these are, these feel like two sides of a very, of, of the same coin somehow, mm -hmm. like the way people interact with sound. Um, and maybe it's fine that these worlds maybe get further and further apart. Uh, but it's an interesting thing to watch, right? People who will never touch a knob and then people yeah. who will solder their own knob. Yeah, I guess it, particularly in the Eurorack scene, the process of, has become more important. I think that's right. I mean, but I also think that that leads to this, this sort of unfortunate stigma that like no music comes out of that world. because I don't think that's true, mm. you know? And I think there's this also this sort of self self deprecating feeling in that community where people are like, Oh, I spent $5,000 and it only makes terrible noises. <laughs> but I don't think that that's, I don't think that's actually the world that those people live in. I think it, they're being too hard on themselves. I think there's a lot of amazing things that happen there that might not look like a song in the conventional sense, but so what? Mm. The music is still interesting. Well, and it's most of the time happening just as they move along, patching something. 
Exactly. It's, it's very fluid. It doesn't leave a trail of itself. You know, it, it's very much a real-time process. But are there any developments of recent years that uh, affected you personally in your creative workflow or choices? So I've, I've taught myself just enough Max to be um, a nuisance to other people who know more about Max. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's enabled me to build little machines that do the sorts of funny things that I like to do, which often have to do with pattern manipulation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, moving things around within a container in, right. in ways that are, that are interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And listening to the results. So I'm very interested in the idea. Like, I'm super lazy. And so I like to be able to build machines that will create lots of variations for me and then audition the variations rather than have to move notes around by hand. That yeah. feels a little bit too much like pencil and paper. So like thinking. macro controls. So, well, but not so much for sound, for musical ideas. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in like, here I have eight notes. Give mm -hmm. me a hundred variations of those eight notes, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. That's personally been really interesting for me and it also... Um, It forces me to figure out, okay, how might I actually build a thing that will do this for me, which is also interesting. So I can solve musical problems and sort of scratch my technical itch at the same time. Mm -hmm. How would you rate the influence of uh, online communities and file and mix sharing platforms and the possibilities thereof in terms of collaborations or maybe even further potentials? This all has its good and its bad side, right? I mean, <laughs> internet anonymity leads to people being terrible to each other in some <laughs> ways. So that isn't so good for the creative practice. But on the other hand, like if you have a particular niche musical or music technical interest, you will find people out there who share that with you. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully they just won't be terrible people. <laughs> <clears throat> But it's impossible to to say i mean obviously that's part of the world we live in now right where the the internet makes this putting these people together possible and you just hope that they get together for reasons that are helpful rather than hurtful in this vicinity or elsewhere in technology is is there anything you would like to see in the future anything particular it's hard for me to say without It, it, I know you want me to talk as a person rather than as a representative of the company, but it's very right. difficult for me to disentangle those things. Okay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just because my interests are often reflected in the work that we're actually doing. Mm. Um, you know, but I've, I mean, definitely this thing about little machines that do funny things to patterns. I think there could be more of that in the world, you know. So aleatory. That, um... Yeah, this sort of thing or systems, mm. building little systems that that use certain simple rules and then make the rules fight against each other, this sort right. of thing. Is there anything you miss or where you would say, why hasn't anyone done this and that? Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised that, that there isn't more. I'm not surprised because it's a really hard technical problem to solve, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm bummed out that nobody has been able to create like perfect source separation yet so i'd like to be able to throw throw a beatles track in and get a guitar part out ah okay you know mm. we're not there yet obviously so a step further than stems yeah i'd like to be able to get it out of the two-track mix yeah but i don't think that's going to happen anytime soon is is there anything you would like to add i just think it's good that that these kinds of conversations are happening and that people are thinking about um, thinking about ways to do more interesting work and also ways to do more interesting work with other people. Like I know I spent the whole first part of this talk talking about how much I like working alone, mm -hmm. but you don't want to do that all the time. Like it's, sure. it's really nice to be able to, to come together in a loop like way and then say, well, what are you working on? Oh, what are you working on? Oh, well, maybe we could work together on this, you know, that this sort of thing I think is really valuable and it's also not new. But um, it's nice to see it happening more. That's a very good last word. Meeting actual people in real places. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, that's, it's never going to go away, you know? Yeah. All right. Uh, well, thank you for taking your time. Thank you. Thank you.